Okay, it's on pause. Great. All right. Let's see. So um, before we get into After Effects, since I kind of know where you're at right now, um, did you attend, I held a workshop last quarter about After Effects and motion graphics. Were you there? Um, last quarter, I took an all track track. So like, that's how I know the really basics of After Effects. Mm -hmm. Because I've just taken a class that went into the Accessible Work Program. Yeah. After Effects and XD and Moira. Um, so, no, I probably did not, but I was taught by like teachers about after effects. And okay, cool. Like, like, yeah, no worries. So, I'm going to show you um, for UX, UI, they have these things called vision videos, which mm -hmm. are like little promo videos about like a product or app or something that they're using. Um, Quint and I made one for the workshop last quarter, and that's what all of the footage in this file is. So I'm just going to pull that up real quick and show it to you so you can see what I did. And then I'll walk you through certain parts of it after we go through the um, UI of After Effects and talk a little bit more about typography and stuff like that. Frogger tracks the steps you take while you're walking. It also tracks every stair you climb, making it the easiest way to see how many levels you're going up. And of course, since this app was made by frogs, we know there's another special way for you to move. Sometimes you gotta jump. So it's really basic, not very intense on the on the motion graphics side. Pretty, pretty simple. I <laughs> Yeah, it's just sort of an intro to get you used to what the different things are that you can do. Um, so first of all, we'll just talk about the UI. And so before I start, just so you know, when you're looking between my After Effects and your After Effects, is some of the panels that I pull up um, might be a little bit different than yours, and that's okay. Um, I work in After Effects every day, and I need some of these panels specifically because of the type of work that I'm doing. So if you see a panel that you're like, I don't know what that is, that's totally normal and you probably don't need it for the stuff that you're working on. Um, so first of all, most important thing is up here at the top, this is your toolbar. And this is where most of the, the main tools are that you'll need. This here is like the little porn tool so you can click and drag things, that's V. You can use this little hand here to, if you click it, um, the Hot key for it is H, and that allows you to drag your composition inside the effects window. You can also have like something else selected and then use your middle mouse button to scroll around if you have a mouse connected. I find that to be a little bit easier personally. Okay. I would definitely suggest investing in a mouse um, for using After Effects because it makes it so, so much easier than using a trackpad. You can use a trackpad, but it's it's not a fun time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, good, yeah. Um, aside from that, you have the rotation tool, which is W. The This is called the pan behind tool, but it really helps you work with the anchor points. Um, that's just where all of your, any keyframes you add will rotate around. So for example, if, if my keyframe here is, or my anchor point is in the center of this image, right? And I do a rotation, it will rotate around this, but if it's in the corner, it will rotate around that corner. So it's just very helpful to know where your anchor point is before you do anything with a layer. Um, you've probably already used this, but this is like the shape tool. You can click and hold down to get access to more types of tools. So the star tool is for any like pointed polygon from triangles to like 10 point stars, um, a regular polygon tool, ellipse, rounded rectangle and rectangle tool, pen tool, text tool. And then these here are more for using rotoscoping, which is drawing on top of like live action footage. I don't know if you necessarily need to do that for your project, but most people don't necessarily touch Roto very often. So 
Um, and this is the puppet pin tool, which is helpful for rigging characters or moving certain elements inside of a like composition. For example, you could put a puppet pin tool like at the top of this tree and then at the bottom and you could warp it like the footage that way. It's a little bit weird and it takes a lot of keyframes to do. So I don't suggest it unless you're trying to rig a character, which I'm not sure you'll be doing, but <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, then the puppet pin tool might be helpful for you. You also may want to consider um, a plugin called Duic Basil, and this is what I use for all of my character rigging. It's pretty complicated. But I think once you, if you continue to use After Effects and get the hang of the UI and you feel comfortable using After Effects as a, as a baseline, then definitely consider getting Duic Basil. It's free and it is a really good character rigger and it's not the most insanely confusing one out there. So um, I can talk you, to you about that in a little bit if you want. Um, <clears throat> after the toolbar, this is obviously where all of your footage and your composition will sit in here. Um, you can zoom in and out of your composition using the, this little drop down menu here. You can scale it to fit. So that will fit exactly inside the window you have set. You can also select it to be whatever you know size you'd like that are that's in these default settings. And it will scale to the center. You can also hit control or command and then use a scroll wheel to zoom in and out. I find that to be the easiest way for me personally, but again, that's just however you work and when you get a mouse. <laughs> Aside from that, the only other really important thing on here is this will is a preview time and it tells you where your little time indicator is on the timeline. And the only other thing is your resolution. So this is this is really helpful for if you're working with a lot of different assets. And you don't want your computer to have to do a RAM render preview uh, in full every single time. It takes a long time for like a computer to render something live so that you can scrub through it properly. So you can use this little drop down here to say, okay, I'm gonna usually when I look at my works before I export them, I'm looking at them in half or third. And then when I export them, I export them in full, which is default. So just so you know, if you are previewing in After Effects in half, and then you go into Media Encoder to export it, it will export in full automatically and you don't have to change that. This is just how you're viewing it in After Effects. Aside from that in the composition, you have your, on the left here, you should have your project files. Um, this is where like, you know, you've used this before, it's where you drop everything. One thing I would suggest is figuring out a way that how you want to organize all of your folders. Have you yeah. used folders before? No. Uh, okay. Okay, good. Okay, good, great. Yep, so you already know how to set that up on your computer so it can take from the local file. Um, have you done setup of like folders inside your After Effects, like right here? Okay, so this is the best way to organize all of your files inside of After Effects. And as you can see, each folder has all of these assets that I've used inside After Effects, just in a little drop down. And how you, there are two ways that you can add folders. You can hit this little button right here that says create new folder, or you can right click inside this big panel and add new folder. And then what that does is that just helps you organize all of the pieces that you have. I prefer to put everything into, I have one render one, which is my final render. So when I'm exporting it in, um, media encoder, it's really easy to find and I don't have to dig through my pre comps. I have a bunch of pre comps. I have any folders where I put all my footage and then I have all my assets. This is 
just tentative for this project. If I have a project that has a bunch of different shots with a bunch of different assets, then I'll adjust how many folders I have inside After Effects just for that. So it stays organized for me. Um, but just make sure that you're, it works for you and everything is labeled because going to like folder 21 and then finding the assets in there is a little confusing after you've been scrolling for, <laughs> for days on end looking at the same project. You can't like color code these, but I mean, you can use like capitalization or like different tabs or asterisks or something to delineate between them if that's helpful for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so that's where like all of your project stuff will sit and you you've taken the like propositions or assets out of here and put them onto your timeline before. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so since you already know how to do that, um, do you you know how to recolor each of these? Yeah. Okay. One thing that might help you speed up your workflow a little bit is, you know, you can click on this and then you can say, I want this to be like fuchsia, right? Um, and, but that does take a couple extra seconds. And for, for speed wise, if you're gonna be working in After Effects for a while, what you can do is, for example, if I want this highlighted layer to be orange, I can just click on this and hit O. So whatever the first letter is here, so red is R and yellow is Y. Um, yeah, and it just helps you speed things up a little bit. If you notice, there are a few that have like duplicate first letters. So like blue and brown, you would just hit B twice and then enter, and then it goes to the second one. So that is how that works. It's pretty, pretty fast. And I prefer to use that instead of clicking. So that's just something that might help you out a little bit. Aside from that, the only other like couple panels that are pretty important is over here. We have all of the like effects and extra fancy stuff that you can use for adjusting characters, tracking alignment. If you are looking for any of these in particular on yours and you can't find them, or for example, let's say I have this character panel open, right? And I accidentally closed the panel and I don't have it anymore. All you need to do is just go to window up at the top here and then add what you would like and it will pop back up. It might populate somewhere else on the UI, but you can drag this wherever you want and it will fit itself there wherever you'd like it. So that's not, does, does that make sense? Great. Yep, okay, awesome. The only other thing is, have you used the um, effect controls panel? I have. Okay, great. I will, I will show it to you then. Um, so just as an example, let's say I have, a, I'm going to take an effect and preset for the sake of time, we'll just use a Gaussian blur and I'm going to put it on, not that layer. I'm going to put it on this little effect control dial. It's this little lily pad here with all of the little flower petals on it. Um, so this is the layer that I'm putting it on. And so what I'm going to do is anything, any effects and presets that I apply to a layer, when you select the layer, they'll show up in the effect controls. So what I'm going to do is you can, oh, someone's in the waiting room. Can I let them in? Okay. Oh, okay. That's totally fine then. Hello. Oh, I don't think he connected yet. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to keep talking. Um, so any, anything that you apply to a layer will show up inside the effects and controls panel. And so what that will do is you can adjust everything from in here. So let's say I wanted to make this really, really blurry. So you can either click and drag to adjust. You can drop down this little arrow and then you can click and drag on here. Although the it only goes to 50 so i don't do that ever i just don't like it you can also click the like amount and then add in that manually yeah if you just click 
if you just left click and hold, then you can scrub from side to side and it will adjust what you have. And then you can just also do it manually by typing it in. So these are like different ways to do the exact same thing. One thing you might find helpful is if you are using multiple effects on one layer, if you click this little FX button right here, then that will disable the effects for that specific effect that you have. So let's say you have like four effects on here and you don't wanna see the Gaussian blur anymore. You can just click the effects and it will go away. You still will keep all of the keyframes that you have, still keep all the settings that you have, but it's just like hidden or invisible. So it's really, really helpful if you're working with multiple pieces or you wanna see what the original file looked like. Do you want me to come over there? Okay. I don't mind. It's okay. No, that is going to pop up under the transform properties okay. here um, because it's not an effect. So the basic properties are anchor point, position, scale, rotation, and opacity. Mm -hmm. Those are for any like shape layer or just like PNG, JPEG, whatever you have. Those are the standard five that you'll have, and those will populate in the transform mm -hmm. because it's not an effect, it's just a property. Yeah. Yep, so th those will all be down here. And if you want to, I don't know if you know the, the quick hotkeys for them, but if you need to pull up just position, you hit P. Do you know how to, have you used that before? No. Yeah. Yeah, this is much faster. So if you need to pull up your position, just hit P. If you needed to pull up, here, let me just move the zoom stuff around. If you need to pull up rotation, R, opacity is O, and all of that will, populate itself on here. So if you also want to look at all of the keyframes that you have in one entire layer, just hit U and all of the keyframes that you have for this layer is selected will pop up. It's only these two for this layer, but um, if I do it for this one, this has this orange one right here, all of these will pop up for any property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually have, um, I'll give this to you at the end, but I have a spreadsheet of like hotkeys. So, and you're more than welcome to take a peek at that at the end and download it or whatever so that you have all of those. But these are just like helpful hotkeys that you'll probably <laughs> really want to use when you're using After Effects because it just makes it so much faster to use. Um, yeah, okay. So now that you have like the effects and presets and you know, about all that. Did you have any other questions about the UI or how to use it or pulling up a panel or something? My main thing is like with UI, you know, Um, it really depends on what you're working on. If you work primarily with like 2D shape stuff, then character and character align and effects and presets, would I say, I would say are the best ones to use. If you're working with inputting information onto live action footage, I would say tracker or content aware fill would be the most helpful. And if you're working primarily with text, paragraph, character, and align would be the best ones. What are you working with primarily? Yeah. Okay. 
I would, yeah, for that, then I would definitely suggest using the um, effects and presets for sure, tracker, content aware fill. And then if you're using text, character and paragraph, um, I prefer to keep them all aligned here on the side and then I just open them as needed. Okay. Yeah, and then again, if you do any more character rigging in the future, I would look into do with Basil. You can also use like rubber hose. That's a really good character rigger. I think that one costs money though. So kind of, yeah, it's like there's nothing wrong with you. Um, yeah, so if you are looking to have more um, like effects and presets on what you're, what you're working on, um, you can go to this, website called AE scripts. Have you ever been there? Okay. Um, so what it is, is this is a place where you can get different scripts and plugins for After Effects. Some are free and some are paid. And you just, you, you kind of have to know what you're looking for when you're going in here. Cause most of this stuff at the top is like paid, like this is $25. Um, and the, the one thing I'm going to say about this is when you're looking for a preset or a plugin, you should get quality of life ones and not ones that animate for you. Because oh. there, are, there are plugins that are like, oh, like three buttons to animate this like stretch and squash. And it's like, no, if you're gonna animate, you should know how to stretch and squash. Um, the quality of life ones are more like copying easing between different layers because it takes forever to use the handles by yourself. And it just is a lot faster for workflow. Um, or adding different colors to certain things. Those are more quality of life ones instead of animating for you. So there are a few free ones that are pretty good, but um, this is just a resource if you want to take a peek. And I got do it off here, I think. And this is in the spreadsheet I have for you at the end, so you don't have to <laughs> memorize this or anything. Okay. Did you have any other questions about plugins or the UI that you want to go over? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. In that case, then you you're good on keyframes. Um, sure. Yeah. So there are five main types of keyframes. Okay, great. So and then um, you already know how to add them by like setting a yeah. marker on whatever you're doing and then add more. Okay, yeah, I mean like that's pretty much it. And have you done easing before? Um, so easing is when you have something like, like interpolation between two keyframes and then F9 is the keyframe to, or the hotkey to ease between the keyframes, which just means that um, I'm gonna pull up this graph right here. This shows you the speed at which it's working. That's this little button right here. The graph editor is like the coolest thing ever and it will make all of your motion like infinitely better. So actually I'm just gonna show you what, I'm gonna show you what the graph looks like with two linear keyframes. And so it looks like this because it's moving from one, one spot to another between these designated times, right? And then if you hit F9, that adds the interpolation between the two. Um, and easing. So it will start up slow and move faster. Hence the graph gets taller because it's moving at 300% per second. And then it will slow down at the end. So that's what easing does. And when you click on these, there are these little handles that will pop up and these are called Bezier handles. And what you can do is you can drag them from side, you can move them up and down and you can move them side to side to adjust how you want your graph to look. And so a graph, for example, like this would start up slow, get faster, and then get slow really quickly. And so that's how using this works. And if you don't like something, you can just hit control Z. But it, this is, I spend honestly most of my time in the graph editor more than anything else that I do in After Effects. Once my assets are in, I'm like, okay, I need it here and then I need it here. And then the rest of my time is just adjusting how the graph looks so that the easing is how I want it. Mm -hmm. Since you didn't know that, you might not know this other little thing called separate dimensions. Do you know about that? Oh boy, okay. Okay, okay, okay. 
So I'm just going to make this little circle right here so I can just show you what I'm talking about. I can show you that after this. Is that okay? All right. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, are you good with, do you know how to add typography into here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll briefly go over text and then I can get to masking too. We have like 32 minutes left. So, and I mean, it's just you. So, um, all right. So this is, you know, we have our little circle here. I'm just going to write this as demo circle. And so what we're going to do is we're going to open up the position. And whenever you have a position in 2D space, you have X and Y, um, no Z. And so what you're going to do is right click on the position and hit separate dimensions. And so what this does is now the X position is completely um, like individual from the Y position. So if I normally, if I move this from here to here, it would just be two position keyframes, but now it would be four. And the importance of making this like separation between the two is when you go into your, you ease it and then you go into your graph editor, um, you can just make different graphs for different sides. So you can have your X movement be one way and your Y movement be another way. And it just allows you to have a bit more control over which side and it's not gonna be the same between the two. Does that make sense? Yep. So, and it, and it shows the two on here. So like this is the Y and then this is the X and it shows you on here as well. So X is red and the Y is green. So I would suggest playing around with those. You can also go here and if you right click on this little graph section, I'm in the speed graph right now, which shows you how many pixels per second it's moving, but you can also go to the value graph and this shows you the like value of like what pixel value it's at. And what you can do is these handles, you can just go crazy with. And so these adjust the movement so it stops and then it's gonna speed up again. So yeah, the graph editor is like the place to be. It's so great. <laughs> so. Um, that's just like two ways of looking at your data. So you can see that this is what the, like the graph is for the value. And then this is, or yeah, the speed. And then this is what the value is. So I would definitely play around with those a little bit that that's like just how they work. Um, but if you make an edit to like one graph like this, it's going to change the speed on the other one. So they're, they're interconnected. So if you're like, I only want to touch the value or only touch the speed, you can totally do that, but they will make adjustments to each other as you work. I prefer to work in the speed. Some people prefer to work in the value. It's just really whatever you prefer. Do you have questions about that? Um, Yeah, sure. So it the speed graph tells you how many pixels per second it's moving. And one thing that you can check is, do you see these little dots here? That is each keyframe between, like if I stop on every single keyframe, and just in case you don't know, the hot key to go through is like controller command and then the arrow key. Um, I'm going through one like keyframe at a time. And you can see that each one of these dots represents where the circle is going to be at any given keyframe based on the interpolation. And so all this is doing is that this is saying that, okay, at this value, right, this is moving at like 730 pixels per second. Um, and then down here, it's moving at 285 pixels per second. Um, since the interpolation is eased so that it starts quickly and then slows down, just based on how that's how you would read this graph. Um, obviously you would say like, okay, this is how fast it will start at this point. And then if this is where it will slow to at this point. Um, I would say that the speed graph is usually the easiest to read because if you have like a higher value, it's going faster. And if you have a lower value, it's gonna be going slower. And I just prefer to read stuff in the speed graph. Um, 
instead of the value graph. Because if you're looking in the value graph, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's going up or getting faster. Like this is moving horizontally and it's getting slower. So that's why I prefer to work in the speed graph, but it's really up to however someone else prefers to work. Did that answer your question or should I yeah. try to repeat it? No, All right. Cool, 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 cool. All righty, do you want me to go over like just briefly about typography? Okay, can I just ask what you already know? Okay, cool beans. So when you're inputting typography, we're gonna adjust this real quick because that is not legible. <laughs> okay, we'll make it we'll make it white. Sure, why not? Um, have you used all of these settings in here? Okay, cool. So I don't need to explain that. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Great. So when we have the type that we're working with. This one, this is the tracking and tracking is the space in between each individual letter. So if, yep, so you can just move this and it will say, okay, this pixel is between the D and the E and the E and the M will be, will be, you know, this value. Yeah. One thing that's really good if you're working with type is to um, adjust that tracking because it makes your type feel a little bit more alive and dynamic. And I can show you how to do that. Yeah, for sure. So when you have your text, instead of like adjusting the scale to make it bigger, what I would suggest doing if you wanna animate the tracking or the opacity or something like that is go to this little animate button and then hit tracking. And now this animator one means this is taken from the animate tab that we were just in. And then the range selector says that this is the range in which it will be, you know, in which the animation will like perform its action. And you can adjust these range selectors to have it go from start to finish, which I will show you in a minute. Um, but how this will work is essentially, let's say I want my tracking to start at this amount. And then by two seconds, right, I want the tracking to be here. Um, it doesn't zoom, it it keeps the position exactly the same, um, but it just adjusts the tracking between so the like space between it. Small, yeah, so if you're doing a lot of typography, I can show you a type piece that I did after this if you want to take a peek, um, and I can show you the file. Do you, would you want to see that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, sure. So this is how it will look, right? So it looks like it's getting like a little bit bigger. It feels a little bit more dynamic. And again, you can always easier highlight your keyframes, ease them, start off with something a little bit slower and then get a little bit faster. So then it, nope, you definitely can. If you wanna move this keyframe over, you totally can. And it will reflect that in the timeline when you go back. Yep, um, I would keep in mind though, that if you highlight both of them, it yeah. will move them both. Okay. Just want to make sure because sometimes I work in After Effects every day and sometimes I highlight both of them and move them and I'm like, wow, I did not want to do that. <laughs> cool. The only other thing is that I would like want to talk about is the range selector. And for that, I think we're going to do, we're going to segue here a little bit into masking as well. Um, so let's, let's pretend like we don't care about the tracking anymore. I'm just going to show you what this will look like if we're going to be adjusting the position. And now if you just wanted your whole layer of type to start here and then move up, you don't need to do this. Um, but we're going to be doing this incrementally. So it's going to be moving up letter by letter. And that is why we do need a range selector for this. So what this is going to look like is we're going to say that the starting position is going to be right here, which is zero, zero. And zero, zero is relative to wherever you have the layer that doesn't correlate to zero, zero on like the actual composition and pixel grid you have. Um, 
So going to here, if we want to say like, if we want it to move up and we want it to go up this high. So at this point, this is what just a normal position keyframe would be. Yeah. We already know how to do that. If let's say we want it to move incrementally, we're going to start this at this point and just move it from one to the other. And so what this does is this is where the end point is, which is this little guy, these little lines right here. And then as we move across, it will go one way or the other. So actually, hang on. Ooh, my After Effects is crashing. Oh, it's okay. Oh, he didn't crash. That's so exciting. I know, like, whoa. So um, you can do this really however you want to do it, but um, Yeah. Definitely. So you just go to the animate and then you go to opacity. And then if you want your opacity to start at zero and then end at 100, you have that as 100 and this one is zero. And then in your range selector, you're going to want it to go across like that. Yeah? yeah. OK, so then you're going to adjust the start of your piece to have start at zero. And then it's going to end at 100, which means it's going to go all the way to this side. So then as it goes across, it will reveal. That's perfect. And then again, you can always adjust this with like keyframes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that um, just make sure that if you're if you're adjusting the opacity and the speed that the opacity changes, like if you want it to start slow and then like speed up. Make sure that you adjust that into the range selector as well, because otherwise the range the range selector and like any other keyframes that you have, they are not like connected. So just make sure that you adjust the easing on all of them. If you're interested, you can also do this another way. And I'll just show you how to do that real quick. Um, and this involves using a mask. So so I'm just going to use a rectangular one for this. But let's say this is this is my mask, right? And this is what I'm going to be using to show you. Do you know the difference between an alpha map and an alpha inverted map? Great. So an alpha map means that anywhere that this layer is, and you need to put the mat on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, so anywhere that this layer underneath has the whatever shape whatever you have um, matted to it wherever those two overlap then the text will be visible you can see that if i move this over then the text becomes visible and you can animate that as such an alpha inverted mat does the opposite so anywhere that this rectangle is present and the text underneath it or whatever you have underneath it is there then it will be invisible and when you move it from side to side then it will show up so for example if you want to adjust the opacity without actually adjusting the opacity, what you can do is you can add a Gaussian blur onto this bad boy rectangle. I have my caps lock on. And then you can put this to like 200, right? So the edges will look feathered. And then you can adjust the keyframes of this position. So then at two, Obviously, we would want it over here because it's no longer, since it's on an alpha invert mat, then you know it'll show up as it moves away. And so then you will have your type move like this. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of different ways to do the same thing. Um, it just kind of depends on if you want to move your the type itself, or because like for example, if I wanted the type to do its own type of like opacity adjustment, like blinking opacity, and then come out in with this transition as well, then I would definitely do it this way. You can do it whatever way you like, but there's a billion ways to do the same thing in After Effects. So that's how that works. Do you have questions about that? 
So alpha, yep, alpha shows you whatever is inside the rectangle or shape, and then alpha inverted will only show you if the shape is not touching it. And that's where the rectangle Yeah, I, I use the shapes tool for like pretty much all my masks. Um, you can like make any shape you want. You can also make a shape using like the pen tool and then have it be like a custom shape for a mask. That's actually what I did um, over here for inside this vision video. Where is he? Aha, yes. So right here, when the phone comes out, right? And it starts to get wiped away. This right here is a, um, so there is the phone layer, which is this guy, and he's on his own little phone scroll. And then on top of it, this is the mask. And you can see that I hand keyframed it so that every frame, it would change size and position. So what I did for that is this is a path that I updated every single frame. I changed the path. And since it's updated every single frame, there's no interpolation between the keyframes. So it's not gonna do any weird movement that I don't want. So you can see that it's not needed until this frame. So I, I have it here as a standard for like, this isn't covered. And then on this next frame, it covers up the corner. The next frame, it covers up a bit more. And I just, used I just looked at the footage with the tree on it to say like okay I know that the tree is like here I'm going to blur the mask just like a little bit and it's on an alpha so again anything that's inside the mask will show up so then as soon as it reaches the edge of this mask it looks like it disappears behind the tree but really how this composition is set up is footage and then we have this phone asset on top of the footage and then we have the mask on top of the phone and the phone is alpha matted to the mask. Yeah. Yeah. Masks were also really helpful when I was making this phone asset. Um, because as you can see, this is, I can show you how this was created, but you can see that the UI inside of it scrolls like incrementally. And I actually was prepared to do a full demo on that. Do you want me to little show you how that's made? Sure. Okay, um, we have 15 minutes. So is that okay? Or do you want me to cover anything else before we? Um, no, they can, because um, I know how you play all the That's, yeah, that's totally understandable. <laughs> um, so what we have here is oops, um, on this little phone guy, I want this to scroll up, right? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it underneath my, um, my little mask. I'm gonna alpha mat, which again means anytime that this is present, with the like mat underneath it, then it will show up. If you move the mat, which is what I'm doing right now, then the mat itself will scroll. But if you want the actual piece to look like it's scrolling, then you'll move this up and down within that mat. And so, you know, this can extend past here and then you can just hit your position keyframes to move it like as a scroll incrementally. And if- Yep, if you open up your layer and immediately hit P, right? And that looks, it's a scuffed scroll, but it's a scroll nonetheless. Um, so anytime I'm keyframing, I select the layer I want. If I know I'm doing position, I hit P. If I want the opacity, then, you know, I hit, uh, if I want to rotate something, I hit R. So yeah, it's really fast. Yeah, it's just, it just takes a long, a lot longer to look at that. And then again, if I'm like, oh, I need to see where all of my keyframes are. I just hit you on that layer. 
This also works for um, anything outside of like, if you don't have anything selected and you hit P, all of the position keyframes for every single layer will pop up. So if you're like, I need to adjust the position for five layers, just hit P and all of them will show up. You can also do a really fun thing where it, let's say, um, I wanna open up position and rotation for this. I'm gonna hit P, shift and R, and it will open up both of them. Yep, so holding, so if you select one and then hold shift and then another one, then that will bring up, populate any one that you want. So it's just a lot of ways to work a little bit faster. And once you get the hang of it, like when I first started using After Effects, I was like, I had a, a spreadsheet open of like all the hotkeys. And then I have my After Effects and I'm like, okay, I need to open this and this. And then I went to my spreadsheet and I'm like, okay, I do that. And it took a lot longer to do all my projects than like I would have wanted, but now it's so fast for me that I, I have collectively saved so much time by just learning it that way the first time. Yeah, so um, alpha and invert and like alpha mat and alpha invert are really like the only two that you'll want to use. The Luma just uses stuff based on like black and white values. Like you don't really need to touch them. Um, I haven't, I've been using After Effects for multiple years and I haven't needed to use a Luma mat for like anything. So um, probably don't need it. And if you do, there's a lot of tutorials on YouTube for how to explain them. Um, and that's masking. Did you have any other questions about masking or how to move stuff in a mask? No? Okay. So one last thing yeah. question. So when I'm dragging the line and I into the bottom area, that's just hiding out. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to make sure that I would actually need it before we do that. So, yep. Okay. No, definitely. So anything that you see in here yeah. is a layer. Okay, perfect. And whether it can be whatever you want it, if it's a null object if you have a png jpeg piece of footage audio um everything is just called a layer here there isn't a special name for like anything you can specifically say like this is like a null object or whatever but um you know all of these are just layers this is called the layers panel yeah no worries and you know how to pre-comp right Oh boy, we're going to talk about three comps then. Okay, so do you see all these little yeah. options up here? Yes. Each one of these is a pre comp, and that means that stands for pre composition. And so, what that looks like is let's pretend that I wanted to have this demo type that we have here. Um, I don't want to have, you know, both of these layers out here. I want to manipulate where I put them. And so, I'm going to select both of them and I'm going to right click on them. And then I'm going to hit pre-compose. And so what that's going to do is going to, it's going to bring up this little pre-compose menu. And I'm going to name this um, demo type because that's what I will remember this as. Make sure that you select move all attributes into the new composition. That just means that everything that you have selected will no longer be in this composition as editable layers. They will be inside the pre-comp as editable layers. I'm gonna hit okay. And now they've been condensed into one layer or pre-comp. If you wanna open that at any point, you can just go, you can double click on it and your demo type is right here. Whenever I'm working in a pre-comp, I usually prefer to keep everything um, centered. So I'm just gonna show you what that would look like if I made it down here and wanted to move everything to the center is I select everything and make sure that since these are position keyframes, I have my timeline on top of the keyframe. And I'm just gonna eyeball it here because I don't really feel like oh, yeah. actually putting it in <laughs> into the center center. And so now this is tentatively in the center of After Effects. And so now it's here. And now what I can do is I can move this pre-comp, move that bad boy down. And now he's where I want in the corner. And I can, and you can add effects on top of this. So, you know, there's a blur already on there. 
you can add a blur on top of this and you don't have, and this will blur the whole thing and not just the type, it will blur everything that's on there. So this is really great for if you're adding secondary motion. For example, a wiggle. The wiggle is like a favorite of motion designers. Um, and the reason why is because it gives it just like a little, little bit of wiggle. I'm not sure if you can, it's very subtle, but you can see that the type is wiggling a little bit. So I'll do it at like 10 so you can see it a bit. Okay. Yeah. And so that's a way that you can add on top of it without having to deal with like, oh, it wiggled outside of my mask. So now I need to make my mask bigger or whatever. So yeah. And then make sure that whenever you make a pre-comp, um, it will put it into a folder. So this is my demo type one. And I would want that in pre-comps because it's a pre-comp and that is not going to be what I select as like the final render. Yep, so that's how you work with pre-comps and then you can color them as you see fit and they work just like any other layer. Yeah. Yeah, so how this works is what this layer is, is the text for, um, it's a pre-comp mm -hmm. and what's inside is, you know, that little, you got to jump thing. Um, and so all of the keyframes here extend like to about here and then the composition, it's like, that's the only part I need. Um, but it, the whole timeline itself goes out to like here, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the reason for that is if you want to change the way the composition is itself is um, you go to composition, composition settings. And this will show you the composition settings for just whatever you're in, which is the text got to jump. This does not change it for any other pre-comp, any layer, anything else, just this one that you're on. And so you can see that the duration for here is eight seconds. And because it is eight seconds, in the Frogger vision video, it will be eight seconds in total. So you can see it starts at about 20 and ends at about 28, right? And so this is just how long the full composition is. Now, what you can do is really quickly, if you say, okay, I don't need that much space. I just want the comp to end right here. What you will do is let's say, let's say you have this like eight second thing and you're like, I only really needed four. You can go to the composition and composition settings and change that or you can use these little work area markers to say like, this is where the work area starts and this is where the work area ends. If you right click in this little bar up here at the top and then you go trim comp to work area, what that will do is it will take any extra time and just condense it to whatever your work area is. So I'm gonna click it and now my, my work area looks like this, right? So it looks exactly the same, just with less extra space at the end. And then on my main comp, you can see that now it's only this long. So it's not necessary that you trim down your compositions. If you have them extend this long and then you use this little, this guy to control where it starts and ends, you can totally do that and you don't need to trim it. But some people prefer to trim what they're, they're working on. Some people don't. Um, if it's for like Usually I don't because I prefer to keep that extra space at the end in case I need to extend the layer or add something. Because if you do want to extend it, you will have to go back into composition work settings and then say like, okay, now I need it to be like 30 seconds. So I just prefer to keep them longer and that just works for my workflow. But if for, it's easier for you to not do it like that, then don't do it. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, well, did you have any other questions? It is like 357, but What's did you have anything else?
Can I come over there and like see what you're working on? Okay. So for this, um, I just make the oak floor so you can see what my top of the hood settings are. And then I just will like drop my files into there. So um, I use this, I use the HDTV 1080-24. And I do it for every single one of my projects. And then I use, then you can adjust the width and height however you want. Um, for frame rate, I work in usually 24 or 12 because I also do frame by frame and I'm not going to sell animate 30 frames because I would want to die. And so, um, so I work in 12 and 24 mostly, but I think it's like 29.93 or something is like the default. Um, don't change it to 30 because this, it renders better in 29.93 than 30. So whatever that, that default 29, whatever, um, you should keep it at that. Yep, and then you can adjust the aspect ratio that you have. Um, if if you shot it in portrait, then it's probably 1080 by 1920. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I think it was just me, and I don't know if, if it's Clint or, oh, it's Arjun. Hi, Arjun. Okay, he's muted and his microphone is off. So I'm here. <laughs> Hello. Fine. But I'm gonna stop the share now. Um this is going to be, I believe, distributed by Flux people. Okay. Um, so I don't I think I'm giving it to them and then they're gonna be distributing it to you guys if you want to like look back at this at any time. Um, but before I go. I don't know if they're supposed to be giving this to you guys, um, but there's like a little resource folder um, and inside of it, these might be some helpful, there's, it's called Motion Media Resources. And I made this little sheet up for you to take a peek at if you want to. Ben Marriott does a lot of After Effects tutorials. He does stuff that's more about like effects or, and like just like cool things if you kind of already know After Effects. And he does more 2D things, not really a lot of live action. But um, it's, they're pretty fun to learn, and it helps you learn more about After Effects and how different presets work together. Sarah Beth Morgan is a SCAD grad. She's really cool. She has Skillshare classes, and some are free. Um, and the one that you might want to take a peek at is the After Effects hotkey list. Um, this is the one made by me. I, it is, there's one for Windows, and then there's one for Mac. So you'll use the Mac one, obviously. Um, but it's all the same. And this is a live document. It's view only for you, but I'll be adding to this periodically as I just go through after effects. Um, so feel free to like save this wherever you would like. Um, this is the After Effects scripts that I showed you at the beginning. And then this is, um, I'm the co-president for our student club, Motion Media Club called Momi Love. And if you need After Effects help or something, um, we have a club discord and Instagram and you're more than welcome to hop in there and join. Also, if you need, if you have questions, feel free to just like DM me on Discord. I'm on there most of the time, and I'd be happy to help you with your questions. Can you hear me? Am I am I audible? It should be. Um, I told Clint about it, so um, that will be given to you. I don't really know in what format though, and I don't know where Clint is, so so I'm not sure. But yes, this this will be available to you for sure. Um, hi, uh, you no, know, we cannot hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? You are muted. Let me see if I can. Can I, um, I can hear me now? Uh, I see that you're unmuted now, but I can't, can't quite hear you. Mm -mm. Okay, great, cool. Um, so um, Arjun just said that all of the resources that I provided there are on the website for you for a startup. Um, so if you just go to the startup website, then that should all be there for you. Mm 
then I will talk to Clint about that. Because that link should be provided there for you. And if it is not, then I will talk to them. Okay. All right, then I will. I'm not sure why it says no demo files available because there are. Um, <laughs> so I'll just talk to them about that then. Thank you. So yeah, all that hopefully will be handled by the end of the day. I don't know. I don't really know what the startup people's schedule is like, but <laughs> that should be on there. Um, yes, it will be posted on YouTube and shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it will be shared on the Flux website, I believe, and probably in the Discord. <laughs> Um, um, I think so, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good, yeah. And if you need motion media help, just join the Discord. And there's a lot of people in there. So there's somebody who could totally help you if you have questions. Yeah. So if I'm more of an expert in the program that is easy to run after effects and there's a lot of ideas, you can size it 